Well, welcome. My name is uh, Mark, and it's great to have you here this morning as, as we're going to embark together on this journey. We're starting a new series uh, today called Heaven on Earth, and it's really about tapping into an understanding of a framework, that there is this framework that God has created that is an invitation for every single human being to be able to step into, to be able to know God, to be able to experience God, to be able to know your purpose in life. There's an invitation of God to be able to do that, and he's given us a framework whereby you and I can experience him, we can know him, and God can do things through us that we never thought was even possible. Did you ever wake up in the morning and just kind of feel like, man, there's so much more in me, I don't even know how to let it out? You ever feel like there's so much more potential, but I don't, even, I don't even know how to discover that potential? I don't even know where to begin with that process. Do you ever have an ache inside of you when you look at the brokenness of the world and you go, there's got to be something I can do, but I just don't even know where to begin with all this stuff. You ever had that living inside of you? There's an ache, I believe, that is inside of every single person. An ache to be able to discover purpose and meaning, to know why do I exist and why am I here on this earth? And that is an ache that God has put inside of you. And we're going to begin to, 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 to look at the framework that God has given us that we can step into. An invitation from him, literally to know him and to experience him. And so we're, we're going to begin this uh, journey together. And, and what I want to do is I want you to, to take a look at with me at the, the four big movements that we see in Scripture. And matter of fact, uh, some of you have gone through Starting Point. Anybody here go through Starting Point? Starting point is awesome. Isn't starting point awesome? In starting point, we kind of help you to begin to put these things together. But this is an even simpler outline uh, than that. And there are really four major movements that you see in Scripture. If you're a believer and you're a student of Scripture, these are four movements that you want to know and you want to be aware of. So let's just talk about what those four movements of Scripture are. It's a four movements of the story of God, if you would. So, number one is this, creation. The Bible begins talking about creation, how God made things beautifully, how stars, moons, galaxies, mountains, rivers, hills, everything was made beautifully, it was made perfectly. As a matter of fact, when God created everything, he looked at it, he said, man, that's good. But there was something that was missing from that, and, and what was missing was people. Because people had the capacity and the ability to commute some, communicate something about God that the moon, the stars, the rivers, the galaxies cannot communicate. They can communicate the character of God. And so God made man and woman. And when he made man and woman, he said, it's what? Very good. Because now everything could be known about God that he wanted to make known. And he couldn't just do it through men. And he couldn't just do it through women. He made both of us man and woman, so there is something that we could communicate about God. And the way that, that in, the, in the beginning that they would have been experiencing creation and all of its beauty, I think is in a whole different realm than what we can even begin to understand. So the first step is creation. The second movement we see in scripture is the fall. And by the fall, we don't mean the season, right? We mean the really bad day. Right? Fall is when, when we decided that we could go further, faster, apart from God, not have God tell us how to live, but we decided, hey, if we could be the judge of how to live, we'll be a whole lot better off. And as soon as we turned our back on God, what happened? Death came into the world. Decay came into the world. Strife came into the world. Breakdown in relationships came into the world. As a matter of fact, the scriptures tell us that the earth was hit with a curse from God. And that's why work is so difficult. That's why living can be so difficult and have so many challenges. Because all this was a result of us turning our back on God. And in that, in that space is where we really live our lives. That's the, the world that we come to know. This broken world that we live in. The third movement in the story of God and in scriptures is redemption. It was the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, what he was doing is he was doing this thing called redeeming us. 
And to be redeemed means to be purchased out of slavery, but it also means to take us from the fallen purpose for which we've been living our lives and now reconnecting us to our divinely created purpose. It means that, that you and I can experience exactly why I was created and exactly uh, the life that I was created to live. He literally came to, to, to do that for us. So what he did is he, he not only taught, but he died on the cross, paid for our sin, took, took every curse about us, took everything we've ever done, everything we would ever do, and took it upon himself and said, blame me for it. He paid for our sins so that everything that separates us from being able to have a relationship with God would now be removed by God and we could be brought into a personal relationship with him whereby he gives you his spirit, transforms your life through that connection. And Jesus was raised from the dead and just as he was raised from the dead, now he helps us to live a life where it's a new life now, like we've been raised from the dead too. And that's called redemption, when he takes us from the lesser things that we've been living for, and he now connects us to the things that we were created to be about. And then, so we've got, we've got fall, uh, excuse me, we've got creation, we have fall, we've got redemption, and the fourth one is restoration. Restoration. That's, the, that's when all things are made right again, where what we started out with in the beauty and the perfection of that ends up being restored again. That's something that we look forward to yet. We're not there. We live our lives in this third movement called redemption. And it's in this space where what God is doing is he's reaching the people that, that have themselves gone through the first two. Hey, we can relate to this. When you begin to take your journey with God, when you begin to open up your life to a relationship with him, you become aware that we've all had our own first two steps. We all know creation. We all know fall. We all know brokenness in the world. We can all think back to a time. Can you think back to a time when you were innocent and you were a child and you first became aware that something was broken in the world? Can you remember going back to a place in your childhood where you realize the world is an unsafe place or the world is a bad place, that something is broken? See, we all live through the innocence of childhood and then experiencing the understanding that our world is broken. I can remember my first time. I was three, four years old, probably closer to four years old, and, and we grew up in a, uh, in a poor blue-collar area in Milwaukee. And we, had, we lived in townhouses there. So one family lived downstairs, and then one family would live upstairs. And, and four houses down from us was my good friend Patrick. And Patrick and I, we would play together, and we were at his house, and we were in a stairwell that leads up to their level, and we're playing with cars on the steps. And Patrick's brother came down the stairs, and he looked at Patrick, and he said, what are you playing with him for? Patrick looked at him and said, what's the matter? And his brother said, He's white. We don't play with white people. And I can remember going, am I white? Is that what white is? And Patrick and I looked at each other, and we were both confused. We had never had categories like that, where you look at people according to their skin color. All we know is we were friends, and we enjoyed being together. But after that day, I never saw Patrick again, and he was never allowed to play with me. And I can remember as a little boy that same year, sitting on the front step of our house that leads right to the sidewalk, and I'm watching the parade go by. It was a parade of army tanks and jeeps with machine guns on them. And I'm waving, and I'm wondering, why isn't anybody coming out to see the parade? This is amazing. And all the soldiers were waving at me as they went by. What I didn't know is they were there for the race riots. And so I had glimpses early on of the brokenness of the world. I got a glimpse early on, something's not right with this. And everybody has their own experiences. As a matter of fact, to be able to identify and go, man, when did you realize that the world was a broken place? You all have a memory. It's a matter of fact, when you're in your small groups this week, that'd be a great thing to share. Hey, when did you realize that something was messed up? And to go back there and understand that this is the world that we live in, and then we all make decisions coming out of that brokenness, and so many bad things follow from that. And so what Christ does is he comes into our space and he redeems us. He literally introduces himself to us, opens up our eyes to the fact that we can be forgiven of sin, that he can come into our lives with his power, that he can transform us, and that he can connect us with the very purpose for which we are created. And it's what he offers and over these next few weeks, we're going to talk about, well, what is that framework that he invites us into to be able to know him 
and to experience him. But one thing that I want you to do today is to consider the fact that that groan that lives inside of you, that aching that lives inside of you, that something's wrong with the world, and I know I've got a part to play in this, that there is something inside of you, a potential that is so much greater than you know. There is a potential that lives inside of you that is waiting to be known, to, waiting to come out, waiting to be expressed, that there's something that you don't even have an understanding that lives inside of you. So today, as you consider that, I want to help you to see where you can get a glimpse of that possibility and how that could live in you. And so we're going to take a look at some interesting people. They're called savants. Does anybody ever, have anybody, has anybody ever heard of a savant? Savant is somebody that has incredible abilities that go far beyond what people realize. So the first one, you guys remember Rain Man? How many of you saw Rain Man? Good movie. Good movie. Rain Man was actually based on a real person. And his name was Kim Peek. Kim Peek was born with severe brain damage. His childhood doctor told Kim's father to put him in an institution and to forget about him. Kim's severe developmental disabilities, according to the doctor, would not let him walk, let alone learn. Kim's father disregarded the doctor's advice. Kim struggled with ordinary motor skills and had difficulty walking. He was severely disabled, could not button his shirt, and tested well below average in a general IQ test. But here's what Kim could do. Kim could take a book and read this page with this eye, and with this eye, read the other page, and in three seconds, completely read those pages. Turn over to the next pages, and three seconds have that. He read over 12,000 books, and he could recall the exact wording and the exact page and location of every single thing that he had ever read. He could recall every single piece of music that he had ever read. And he, and he had something that, that, that they call calendar calculating, where you could name a date, and you can look at him, and you could say, hey, Kim, December 20th. 1490, he'd go, Tuesday. He'd go, okay, well, how about this one? July 12th, 2026, he'd go, Friday. And he instantly knew the day of the week that, that you were referring to. He had the ability to recall all of these things. Where did that come from? It was in him. Listen to Jason, about Jason Padgett. Jason Paget, in 2002, two men savagely attacked Jason Paget outside of a karaoke bar, leaving him with a severe concussion and post-traumatic stress disorder. Before the injury, Paget was a self-described athlete and party animal. He hadn't progressed beyond pre-algebra in his math studies. I cheated on everything and never cracked a book, he said. But all that would change the night of his attack. Paget recalls being knocked out for a split second and seeing a bright flash of light. Two guys started beating him, kicking him in the head as he tried to fight back. Later that night, doctors diagnosed Paget with a severe concussion and a bleeding kidney and sent him home with pain medications. Paget was a furniture salesman from Tacoma, Washington, who had very little interest in academics. But he developed the ability to visualize complex mathematical objects and physics concepts intuitively. The injury, while devastating, seems to have unlocked part of his brain that makes everything in his world appear to have a mathematical structure. I see shapes and angles everywhere in life, from the geometry of a rainbow to the fractals in water spiraling down a drain. It's really just beautiful. And everything he looks at, when he sees a tree blowing in the wind, he looks at the leaves, and what he's seeing is he's seeing everything in relationship to pi. And he's looking at that, and he's seeing all the geometry of it and the order of it, and he sees a beauty that you and I don't normally see. But he has the ability, this was unlocked in him, the ability to see this. He takes life, and he begins to draw out the things that he sees. And so he's done uh, several uh, drawings. One of them we'll see here. This is, he calls this the light of pi. And it's an expression of what he sees mathematically happening in the universe 
all the time. Everything is a matter of triangles. Everything is a matter of mathematical formulas. Now listen, I'm not wired for that. I'm the Asian guy without a math chip, right? <laughs> now anybody here good at math? I'm not going to make fun of you, but you good at math? Okay. I remember when my son, when he first took his, uh, his first uh, math college courses, he said to me one day, he said, Dad, the universe is so beautiful. Everything is mathematical. Everything is beautiful. There's an order to it. He says, really, it's just amazing. And I thought, whose son are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? That's not in my genes. Not her, my own Maria's genes. But that's how he sees things. And this is how, how Paget sees the universe. That all the time he sees everything flowing in these mathematical things. He takes his hand and he sees it moving through a space-time continuum. He's taking the theory of relativity uh, from Einstein and he's taking the Doppler effect and he's talking about how things move through space and time. So take a look at how he looks at his hand. That's it. And he says, I can see it this way. I see it moving through space and time. I see it. And this is reality. Now, now here's what I think, guys. This is something that unlocked in him, and he's seeing reality this way. Could it be that that's the way that Adam and Eve experienced life, that there was, they saw more than what we realized, that when they saw the beauty of all that God created, they saw the order of it, they saw the mathematics of it, they saw the geometry of it, that they were able to experience in, about, about the world and be wowed in a way that we can't even begin to imagine. Because here's the truth, when the fall came, things weren't destroyed, they were marred, they were diminished, our capacities were diminished. But apparently there are parts of you that live inside of you that you don't know about. There is, there is capacity that you don't even know that you have within you. And it is a part of your divine design as one who's created in the very image of God. And that this lives inside of us. And that there's a way of knowing and experiencing life and a way of knowing God that it probably is beyond what you even realize, that you have more potential in you, not only capacity to know God and have relationship with him, but a capacity to love in a way that you've never loved before, a capacity to do all kinds of things in a way that you never knew possible because you were created by design for this. And so Paget gives lectures on relativity now and on physics and the Doppler effect and how life and reality are experienced and and he and he draws these pictures and and neuroscientists have tested him and the question that it begs is this so do abilities like pagets lie dormant in everyone waiting to be uncovered and here's what they say most likely there is something dormant in everyone that paget tapped into how about another one, Orlando Cerro. Orlando, it was on August 17th, 1979, when a baseball hit him in the head. Cerro was only 10 years old. He fell to the ground and he was stunned. He got up and he kept playing ball. But it, he began to have headaches. And for days, he, his head throbbed with blinding pain. And then the headache stopped. And Orlando realized suddenly that he could remember everything. He knew what clothes he'd worn, what the weather had been, had been like, and what he'd had for breakfast for every day of his life. He could remember everything suddenly. There was something that was unlocked in him. He also developed the, the calendar calculator, the ability for anyone to name a date, and he would instantly know what day of the week that date was something was unlocked within him there's another man named daniel tammet he had epileptic seizures as a child he was autistic and he had asperger's syndrome but daniel tammet could tell you pi to 22,514 decimal points and he could tell you off the top of his head Daniel Tammet was able to master 10 languages. I actually watched a program where what they did is they put him in Iceland, which is supposed to have one of the most difficult languages to learn in the world because it's not related to anything else. He spent a week there, and at the end of the week, they brought him in front of an interviewer, and he began to converse in Icelandic. It takes him one week to learn language. He has a capacity to be able to do that. He sees numbers and days 
and this is common among savants, numbers and days, even sounds, as having colors, textures, smells, and tones. And sometimes when they hear music, they see colors that that music is. When they see a number, it has a smell. That's how they're able to come up with these answers. When you ask them a question, when you ask them things like multiply, this is Daniel Tammet, take 37, what is 37 to the power of 4? He can tell you because what happens is there's a smell that comes with a number and he sees it and he tells you what it is. He has that capacity. Derek Amato, I just read about him a few months back in 2006. Derek Amato dove into a pool and hit his head on a shallow bottom. He blacked out and he woke up in the hospital disoriented and terrified. His head injury left him with massive hearing loss, chronic headaches, and memory problems that still persist to this day. Yet Derek considers the accident the best thing that's ever happened to him because in the days after the accident, Derek began to see moving black and white shapes, a continuous stream of musical notation flowing behind his closed eyelids. And even though he had never been musically inclined, he suddenly had the ability to sit down at a piano and play intricate pieces that take most people years to perfect. He puts on concerts where he literally takes what's happening in his mind and he plays. He never had that ability before. Inside of every one of you, there is something that has not been unlocked. Inside of each one of us, there's an ability to experience life in a whole different way. And what these savants show us is that there's a part of us that is still waiting to be unlocked, that you have an incredible capacity and a potential that goes far beyond what you even realize. A young man named Stephen Wiltshire took 20 minutes and they flew him in a helicopter over New York City. Here's what happened, check this out. It's a beautiful city. Lots of uh, skyscrapers. My favorite is uh, the Empire State Building. It's a brilliant building. It was so beautiful out there. Nice and sunny. Every aspect of what he sees comes alive on paper. So this morning I figure it out. We'll start with the Brooklyn, up to the Midtown Manhattan, all the way to Queens. Gonna start now. I would love to be in his mind to actually see how he sees things. Stephen was mute until the age of five. So drawing was um, a form of his speech. This was his language. He has a phenomenal memory and is able to memorize cityscapes, landscapes, how many windows, floors, chimneys. To watch the ink touch the paper, it's almost like fine embroidery. You can actually see it develop. I never get tired of it. This is it, it's done now. So I feel happy and good. I'm very proud of my work. It's purely Stephen's own determination that he is where he is today. Do the best you can and never stop. What do you think of that? Isn't that pretty amazing? So what do we know? We know that there is a part of every single person a potential that is even greater than what you realize you and I have. And though there is a part of us that was marred in the fall, the work of Jesus Christ is to redeem us, to be able to, to bring to life those things that are not alive within us. And for us to be able to step into a realm and operate in a framework that God invites us into where everything that God wants to communicate about himself through you, he will communicate. That's why he sent Jesus. 
And there's a groan inside of each one of us, an aching that says the world is not the way it should be. And I know that there's a reason why I was created. And we're going to discover all that. And for some of you, the, the first step in that is to just believe that you've got a Savior. That Jesus Christ loves you so much that he freely paid for your sins and died on a cross and took every sin that you've ever committed and every sin you would ever commit upon himself. He said, blame me. And in so dying, he forgives you. And when you turn from being your own boss and you surrender your life and say, Lord, I want you to rescue me out of the lesser purpose that I've lived for. And God, I want your power in my life. I want you to show me why you created me. And he will take you right where you are and he'll say, now we can start. And it starts right there. There is such potential inside of every single one of you for God to do something in you and through you that is so amazing. Take a look. That ache lives inside of us. Paul describes it in Romans chapter 8 this way. He says, yet we, what we suffer now in this fallen world is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us or in us. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. And against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in a glorious freedom from death and decay, the restoration of all things. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering, we too, with eager hope, wait, or excuse me, with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved, forgiven, brought into relationship. And so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you would. And maybe you're here today and you think, my life is so broken. There's no way God could do that with it. I'm telling you, by the authority of Jesus Christ, he has the authority to forgive sin. He's the authority to send his spirit into your life. He's the authority to give you a new beginning. Your role is to place your faith in him. Surrender and trust him with your life. And he will start there. And right where you are. You can take that step today. And between you and him, you can take a step of faith by talking to him and telling him something like this. Dear Lord, I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. And take away all the brokenness of my life. I turn away from being my own boss and I surrender my life to you, the one who died for me and the one who rescues me. And so right now, I ask you to come into my life, Lord Jesus. I ask you to come in with the power of your Holy Spirit and change me, make me new, and help me to live the life you created me to live. From this day forward, you're my God, and you're my Savior. Thank you, Lord. And Father, may you continue to stir in each one of us an ache, a groaning, a sense that there is so much that, that you could bring through us to truly help people see heaven on earth. May you continue to stir that. And Father, through this series, may you speak to each one of us in beautiful ways. 
God, we want you to be glorified in all of it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Hey, guys, let's tell God thank you.